Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Before I begin the sermon today, I want to express my gratitude for those that made the trip out earlier this month to my garden on the Sabbath afternoon. I saw a lot of people there from the Wilcox Church, and it was just such a delight to share the garden with you and to just enjoy the fellowship and enjoy God's creative wonders, for sure. Before we open God's word, let's just invite God's presence. Dear Father in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. During the early days of transatlantic flight, a plane was droning its way across mid-ocean when a voice came over the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have two announcements to make, he said. I have some good news and I have some bad news. The bad news is that we're lost. The good news we're making excellent time. <laughs> Brethren and sisters, whatever is the purpose of dashing along through life if we don't know where we're going? Amen. During the last year, you pulled yourself out of bed 365 times. Most of those times, you pushed yourself off to work. You probably worked all day until you finally fell into bed at night with your work seemingly only half done. And if we let life's pressures get to us, if we let life have its way, it's easy to come to the place where we act as though getting up and going to work and falling back into bed is all that life is about. But each week, God has reserved a special time called the Sabbath. Amen. Brothers and sisters, one reason that we're here is to take a little time to decide the direction that we want to go with our lives. We do that every week on the Sabbath. We have other times during the year, like a communion service, typically quarterly in our churches where we re-examine, where we stand before God and work on our relationship with God and make things right with God. We do it every year at camp meeting. My family has been going to camp meeting for other than the last few years when it was closed, probably over 30 years in a row. And it's just a wonderful time to get out in nature and get away from the routine and to just focus on our relationship with our Creator. Do you really know where you're going? I want to make this service a special time of reflection. And I want the Holy Spirit to speak to each heart and make each one willing to make this Sabbath a time of new beginning with the Lord. Westminster Abbey is a giant cathedral in London, England. The church is world famous. It's one of the most beautiful of the many old churches in England. The floor plan of Westminster Abbey is in the shape of a Latin cross. The church is 513 feet long. The cross arms extend 203 feet. The main hall is 38 feet wide and 102 feet high. The twin towers on the west are 225 feet high. Quite an impressive structure. Especially when you consider that the main part of the abbey was begun over 770 years ago. In the year 1245 by Henry III. It was added on to during the next several hundred year, years. Westminster Abbey marked the scene of many great events in English history. 
All the English rulers from the time of William the Conqueror, except Edward V and Edward VIII, were crowned there. Royal weddings have taken place there. Most recent one was William and Kate. Seventeen royal weddings in all have been performed there. Burial in Westminster Abbey is one of the greatest honors that England can give. Many kings and queens are buried in the chapel of Henry VII. Political leaders and other important people of England are buried in other parts of the Abbey. The bodies of many of England's greatest poets lie in the poet's corner. Many famous soldiers and scholars and religious leaders are buried beneath the Abbey's floors and behind its walls. A plaque bearing the name over each tomb, those whom England would honor most. God, too, has his Westminster Abbey. Today I'd like us to review Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. You're welcome to follow along in your Bible. Because in Hebrews 11, God lists those whom He somehow seems to honor most. And I would like in our imagination to spend a little time today walking down the corridors of God's Westminster Abbey and look at those whom God chooses to honor most. The list begins in verse 4 with Abel. Of course, he was the first martyr. Goes to Enoch. Naturally, he walked with God. He never tasted death. But then we turn the corner, and we come to a plaque, and across it, the name Noah. Well, the picture gets a little fuzzy right there. Noah was a great man of faith, to be certain, to build that big boat up there on the side of a dry hill. But you know, when the flood was all over, Noah celebrated by getting drunk. What would you think of our conference president if he celebrated a successful camp meeting by getting drunk? But there he is, Noah, one whom God would honor most. But that's nothing. Nearby is Rahab, verse 31. Rahab was a prostitute in God's Westminster Abbey, one of God's special people? Really? One whom God would honor most. And again, as we turn the corner, I see the name Abraham. A long four-foot plaque bearing Abraham's name. Four verses in Hebrews 11 about Abraham. You remember Genesis 12, we talked about it recently in our lesson study, Abraham, the husband of Sarah. And he said, Sarah, you know, when we get down there to Egypt, the pharaohs have a way of taking pretty girls, and you know what happens to their husbands. And so please tell them that you're my sister. And when Pharaoh found out that he had been lied to, he threw Abraham out. But God took him in. A liar, a cheater. What Abraham did, that's worse than cheating on your income tax. But there he is, one whom God would honor most. But after all, you say Abraham had learned his lesson, right? Wrong. Remember years later, Genesis 20, when Abraham tried the very same lie on Abimelech, king of Gerar, again saying that Sarah was his sister, and the trouble that that experience got him in. And let's not forget Abraham's lack of faith in taking Hagar to be the mother of the child of promise, taking matters into his own hands. And yet, Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abraham, one whom God would honor most. Moses, six-foot plaque 
bearing Moses' name. There's more about Moses in Hebrews 11 than any other person. Six verses. Moses was a murderer. He killed a cop. David. David was both adulterer and murderer. You remember the story? It began with the king being a peeping Tom. And he looked out over his roof and he said, that looks pretty nice to me. And he brought Bathsheba into his house and she became pregnant. And then he tried to have her husband Uriah dispatched and the only way he could perform that act was by committing murder. And there lies David today in God's Westminster Abbey, one whom God would honor most. Other men honored in Hebrews 11 include such sinners as Jacob, that liar and cheater and Jephthah, who offered his own daughter as a sacrifice to God, and Samson, that weak, strong man. <laughs> now, whatever is the lesson in all of this, that God is not particular? No. The lesson is that with God, it's not what you've been, but what you're becoming that counts. Yeah. And dear sinner, it's not what you've done, it's what you're doing that counts. In other words, growth is more important than height. I thought my grandkids would be here today. We kind of decided at the last minute that she would, uh, my wife would start taking them to the local Sabbath school in Sierra Vista just to get a sense of uh, continuity, you know, because every week they kind of go along with me at different Sabbath school. So she thought maybe that would be best. But I measured them recently. Of the three kids, the oldest was 57 inches. And then 53 inches. The youngest, 51 inches. The heights were all different. Was I concerned? No. Their size is not a real concern at all. What is important is that they're healthy. What is important is that they are all growing. And if your children or your grandchildren stopped growing during their childhood, then you get worried. I wonder if I might be speaking to some in this congregation today who have walked at one time very close to God and you have felt your hand in His and His presence a power within your life but you've not grown since then. Mm -hmm. Oh dear brother, dear sister, I don't know how high you may have risen but if you're not right now, today, in the process of growing, you're in the process of being lost. Amen. There is no experience in your past that is sufficient to recommend you to heaven today. With God, it's not what you've been, but what you are becoming that counts. This brings a frightening warning to the complacent Christian a one-time conversion experience is not enough. When our second child was born, my wife and I struck a bargain. And I felt I had struck a pretty good deal. We had two children now, and there were two of us. So my thinking was I would look after one and she would look after the other, you know, in the middle of the night when they get up. Well, you can imagine I picked the older one. <laughs> I was thinking, but it didn't work out quite as slick as I thought it would. Because we took the oldest one out of her crib right about then and put her in a regular bed for the first time. And she hadn't learned how to stay in. And one night I heard a thump on the floor and she started to cry, a dutiful father, oh, that's mine. <laughs> I got up and I picked her up and I tucked her back into bed and I went back and went off to sleep. Just in time to hear a thump and there she was out again. 
And I got up and I put her back into bed. A little more irritated this time, but then I headed back and my head no more than struck the pillow, then thump, she was out the third time. By then I was thinking that I had struck a rather poor bargain. Well, something had to be done. So this time I did my best to wake her up. I explained to her this was not the proper procedure. I said, honey, you keep falling out of bed. What do you think is the problem? How come you keep falling out? Oh, daddy, she said, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. Has that happened to you? Here in the church, maybe you've had a genuine conversion experience, but have you stayed too close to where you got in? Is there today some neglected sin in your life that used to bother you a great deal and you still have that sin? It just doesn't bother you quite so much anymore. Mm. Is there a lowered standard? At one time, was your moral standard a little different from what it has gradually become of late? Are you finding it harder to find time to spend with God on a personal, everyday basis with God? It's not what you've been, it's what you're becoming that counts. And what are you becoming? How does your Christian experience compare today with what it was last Sabbath? with what it was last month. How about a year ago? How about 10 years ago? How about when you were baptized? Have you stayed too close to where you got in? With God, it's not what you've been, it's what you're becoming that counts. It's not your height, it's your growth that counts. And that's frightening news to the complacent Christian. But here's the good news. It's comforting to the guilty. I offer you hope today. There's not one sin represented here that needs to ruin your future. Because with God, it's not what you've done. It's what you're doing about what you've done that counts. Don't you see? God honors overcomers. If you have your Bible, please turn a few pages forward from Hebrews to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to spend just a few moments in the first chapters of Revelation. Revelation 3 and verse 21. We're talking now about overcoming. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. How is it that rascals like David and Rahab and Moses and Abraham are those whom God would honor most? It's because great sinners that they were, they were greater overcomers. And when David realized the terrible things that he had done, as Nathan the prophet stood before him, he went away weeping bitterly, and he sat down and he penned Psalm 51, Purge me with hyssop, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. One of the greatest sinners of all time, but he was a greater repenter, and God gave him a heart like his own. Abraham, you know what I like about Abraham? He was still working on perfection at age 99, according to Genesis, the 17th chapter. He never stopped growing. Sometimes as we get a little older, you know, the concrete sets. And I want to speak kindly but very frankly to the older folk who are here today. Never credit yourself with overcoming sin that you've grown too old to enjoy. Mercy. 
we tend to abandon sin after sin as we run out of energy to commit them. I hope it's not the case here, but there are, are a lot of middle-aged and older professed Christians that are mighty cantankerous and hard to get along with. And they don't understand why their kids don't want their religion and their neighbors for that matter. It's because their religion hasn't changed them very much, at least as their kids see it, at least as their neighbors see it. Not Abraham. 99 years old, he and God were still working together on Abraham's Christian growth, overcoming. And Moses, his problem was pride and temper, and the Bible says that he became the meekest man on the face of the earth. Numbers 12, verse 3. So why this list of awful sinners in Hebrews 11, God's Westminster Abbey, those whom God honors most? Because these great sinners were greater overcomers. And God honors overcomers. Heaven is for the overcomers. Amen. Back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. We read the one that was uh, addressed to the Laodicean church that we believe to be our church today. What about the other churches? What's God's message to them? Revelation 2 and verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that what? that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God verse 11 he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches he that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death verse 17 he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it verse 26 and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations and then chapter 3 verse 5 he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels verse 12 him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven for my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Amen. Now what does that last one mean? He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. What does a pillar do in a temple? It supports it. It holds it up. We're talking here about the temple of God being held up by overcomers. Now certainly all who are saved will bear witness throughout eternity of their Redeemer. But the time when the universe is shocked with awe is when great sinners who have become greater overcomers through Christ get to heaven this is the greatest proof of God's power the power to change lives to save even me amen and so it's the fact that such despicable self-centered unloving persons through an experience with the power and the blood of Jesus Christ get to heaven that's going to be the thing that really proves the power and the character of God to the universe they're the pillars in the temple they're the ones the overcomers who hold up God's kingdom throughout eternity an example to the universe of the transforming power of Jesus Christ wow. with Christ overcomers come first when Jesus stepped forth from the tomb on that bright Sunday morning why did he go to Mary Magdalene first 
I would never have done it that way. Hmm. I'd have gone to Pilate or to Caesar. Hmm. That's where I'd have gone. Hmm. And I'd have proclaimed, now look here, Caesar. Hmm. Look here, Pilate. All of your crosses and all of your soldiers and all of the seals on this door are not enough to hold me back. Or maybe I'd have gone to Caiaphas, the high priest, who had vehemently accused Jesus of blasphemy, who had incited the crowd to cry out, crucify him, crucify him, who derided him and mocked him and scorned him and taunted him, wagging their heads. I'd have gotten right in his face. And I just said, see now, there are going to be more following me now than ever before. Mm. That's what I would have done. Or at least I'd have gone to Mary, Mother Mary. And I'd have said, don't we, Mother? Don't cry for me anymore. I'm alive. Why did Jesus appear First to Mary Magdalene, that notorious sinner, so that every sinner in this congregation today would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that with the risen Christ, sinners come first. Hmm. Desire of Ages, page 568, talking about Mary Magdalene. And I invite you to insert your name in place of Mary's name as I read this passage. Desire of Ages 568. Mary, insert your name there, had been looked upon as a great sinner. But Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. It was he who lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin in his, to his unsullied purity. And in his strength, she had overcome. Amen. Amen. And so with God, it's not what you've been. It's what you're becoming that counts. Overcoming. If overcoming is so important, how can it happen in your life? How can it happen in my life? How to overcome? We overcome through Jesus Christ. But remember, Christ will not go contrary to your choice or your freedom hmm. or your will even to save you. Freedom is that important to God. He created us as free moral agents. It's up to you. Do you know why we're not growing more spiritually? Because we don't want to badly enough. Oh, we want to. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't want to. But where will you be? What will you be doing the rest of the day today? The rest of the week? The rest of this year? We just don't want to grow badly enough. Let us never forget the power, the strength that is available in the human will. Christ himself cannot save you unless you are deadly in earnest about being saved. There's a parable about a frog. The frog was hopping along, and he hopped right into a hole. And it was a deep hole. The sides were very steep. And he jumped, and he jumped, and he jumped, and he jumped, and he could not get out of that hole. A friend happened along up on top, and as he looked down, he saw this poor frog jumping and jumping and jumping, the frog said, please, I can't get out. Okay, said the friend. He went off to get a ladder. 
In a few minutes, the friend came back, dragging the ladder behind him. And here sat that frog on top, out of the hole now. Well, you can imagine the friend was pretty aggravated after all that expended energy. And he said, what happened? How did you get out? The frog said, I jumped out. The friend said, you told me you couldn't jump out. He said, I couldn't, but a snake crawled in, and I had to. <laughs> the power of the will. Your will, united with Christ's power, that's what makes overcomers. You provide the desire, you provide the will, and Christ provides the power and the grace. And that combination is omnipotent. It doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, but your will. And incidentally, it doesn't matter if it's that much or if it's that much. So long as you yield all that you have, Christ will make up the difference. And so here's a simple equation for being an overcomer. Your will, whatever it is, weak or strong, your will plus Christ's power equals overcoming. Mm. Simple equation. Back just a few pages from where we were in Revelation. 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. 1 John 4.4 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Brothers and sisters, there are some powerful temptations out there, but there is unlimited greater power up there. And so with God, it's not what you've been. Be it good or bad, it's what you're becoming that counts. Please don't be worried about what you've been, but by the grace of God, please don't be satisfied with what you are. Amen. The people whom God would honor most, His Westminster Abbey, were people who struggled with sin all their lives. But that is exactly the point. They struggled and they struggled and they struggled and they overcame through Jesus. We're all familiar with Hebrews 11 being the faith chapter. The first few verses of Hebrews 11, which is our scripture reading today, continue the theme of that message. They show us how we also may be overcomers. And so I want to close today with Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. This is the Phillips translation that I've chosen to use. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Surrounded then as we are by these throngs of witnesses, the ones that we just read about in Hebrews 11, these witnesses to the power of Jesus, the list of overcomers. Surrounded then as we are by these, let us strip off everything that hinders us, as well as the sin which dogs our feet, and let us run the race that we have to run with patience, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and the goal of our faith. For he himself endured a cross and thought nothing of its shame because of the joy he knew would follow his suffering. And he is now seated at the right hand of God's throne. Think constantly of him enduring, of him overcoming all that sinful men could say against him, and you will not lose your purpose or your courage. In short, to be an overcomer, learn from those who have come before. Learn from your own experience. And especially, most importantly, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Think constantly of Him. Look full in His wonderful face 
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Let's sing that beautiful hymn together now as we close. Number 290 in your hymnal. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Maybe our will is faltering. Maybe our will is strong. But we know that if we give all of our will to you and will to serve you and will to follow you and will to become like you, that you will provide the power, you will provide the grace, and you will help us each one to be overcomers. Lord, we want to be overcomers. We want to go home with you. So whatever we bring to church today, we know we can leave here having been saved, having had all of our sins forgiven. And we're so thankful today that you offer those things through Jesus and his blood. Lord, bless each one here. Bless our families. 
bless this church family and lord help us all to seek after you to turn our eyes upon jesus every day so that we too can be overcomers in jesus name we pray amen, amen.